I have to get comfy. Hold on. Hold the phone, everybody. Welcome to a book review in bed. Why are we in bed? Because I'm trying to remove as many hurdles in my life for things that I procrastinate. I was supposed to film this a long time ago. And then finally today I woke up and I'm like, okay, what's going to make me like actually do this book review? And then I was like, well, if I can do it in bed. And I was like, okay, done. Welcome to a book review in bed. Today we're going to do a book review of the secret history. I'm showing you what this looks like in case you forgot what it looks like after seeing it 4,000 times on TikTok, if not more, because I know that you've seen it as many times as I have. At this point, it's like the Book Talk Bible. And even though it was published 30 years ago, it's definitely been like revitalized by TikTok, I think by younger readers, I guess. And rightfully so, I am going to just say that I think it deserves all of the hype it gets and more. That's not to say that I don't have my own criticisms of it, like there's a few criticism, cr criticisms that I have, but I think for the most part this book is stunningly written and I think it has mostly withstood the test of time in many ways. Okay, so people love The Secret History because of the dark academia aesthetic in it. I didn't know what it was about. Like, no one's ever explained it. I think the blurb on the back of the book, like, does not fit what this book is about. You can pause to read this, but in my opinion, it's incredibly boring and dry. Did you get anything from the back of that? Like, if I picked that up and saw that, I'd be like, I'm not interested in that. This book is literally about a group of friends that try to cover up a murder of one of their friends. Like, that is the single pitch line that we need, and I think that everything else honestly comes second, even though the dark academia aesthetic is, like, in this. Uh. So basically, yeah, no one specifically talks about what the book is about, but that's what it's about. Maybe I missed the memo on that. Of course, after all of its hype and stuff, I was like, okay. Hey. I finally bought this book because I was in Portugal. I went inside this old historic bookshop, and I wanted a book as a... Oh my god, I forgot the word! Oh, this is so embarrassing. Souvenir! Oh my god. I truly forget the English language as soon as a camera turns on. So basically, I wanted a souvenir when I went into this shop, and the first book I saw that was like on my TBR was this copy of The Secret History. And of course, it's beautiful. Like, I'm not a hardcover girly, but huge fan of this one. This is the 30th anniversary edition. Um, they stamped the inside of it. It's beautiful. I was just a big fan. Like, physically, it, like, felt good to hold in my hands and I was obsessed with it. I had no idea the ride that I was about to be buckled in for. After I buy this book, we walk across the street, we go to this church, and I started reading this book. And if you've read this book, you know that, like, inside a Catholic cathedral is probably not the most fitting place to begin reading this book, but I couldn't help it. <laughs> This just is a small example of how this book draws you in so quickly and it holds on. Like, it does not let you go. I think it's one of the most effective prologues I've ever read because it draws you in so much. I think that the reason for that is because it's basically like, yeah, we like murdered our friend and then the FBI came, it snowed so they couldn't find his body, and it's just like the most casual mention of such a horrific thing that you're just like, hold hold on, you gotta back up, like, I have so many questions. I think this starts the two questions in the book that drag a reader through the book, even if you're not enjoying the rest of the book, which I loved the rest of the book, but I think that the two questions that it brings up that are the most powerful can lead any reader through the book. The first question is, why do they kill Bunny? Even after that question is answered, like, halfway through the book, the second question that comes up is, are they going to get away with it? The fact that you want these literal murderers to get away with murder is just a demonstration of how effective Donna Tart is in her writing and especially kind of like manipulating you through her characters and the viewpoints and the opinions that you have that changed throughout the book if you read it the way that I did. Beyond the kind of like dark themes and the air of mystery around this book, I think one of my favorite parts is the prose itself. Like if my writing could ever be perceived as like similar to another author's, I think that Donna Tart now takes first place for that because her prose is just so stunning without feeling like you're kind of like bogged down in a ton of like unnecessary prose. It's beautiful, it's flowery, but it's in a tasteful way that just like makes the writing like almost delicious to like read. I think that it fits so well with the aesthetic of the book. The setting itself is incredibly beautiful. It's very haunting, it's very sensual. I think that she 
just captures the essence of dark academia and even just like the little details that she puts in to her descriptions of these locations whether it be at this new england college or whether it's like at you know the summer home that they go to i just i can't ugh, it just it just drags you in donna tart does a really excellent job at doing like a juxtaposition with her settings. There are all of these beautiful settings in the book, but on the flip side, there are so many parts of the book that Donna Tartt displays so well that are tied to real life that it kind of yanks you out of like these dreamlike trances that you are in, in reading about these beautiful settings. That is only done by her also describing real world places, I guess rural America and like the real places that come along with it. We're going to get into the characters now. If I could describe in one short phrase, Richard's relationship with all the other characters, it would basically be that there is like sensual tension between Richard and everyone else. There's actually a diagram for this that I saw on Pinterest that I'm going to put here. I don't know who did it, so I wish I could give proper credit for this. I also posted about it on TikTok, but I think this diagram sums up like the relationships and the tensions that are between all of the different characters in the story, but somehow Everyone has some kind of, like, chemistry with Richard except for Bunny, but even then, I don't know. There's even some instances maybe you could argue that Bunny has those moments with Richard. So we're going to talk about Richard first. Richard is the main character, and I liked Richard. Actually, I really liked Richard, okay? I know that there's many people that don't like Richard, and I think that their arguments are completely valid, and I agree with. He is kind of like a floppy character at times who's just kind of, like, dragged through the lives of these other people and he just kind of goes along with it because he wants this sense of belonging that these people are giving him. He reminded me maybe in the first 30 pages or so of Nick from The Great Gatsby. I think it's for more than one reason. First, I think that like his narration and maybe Donna Tartt's writing is a little bit reminiscent of Nick in The Great Gatsby and like his voice and like the monologue and stuff that goes on inside his head. But I think also because in this book it's basically about Richard being dragged through like the dumpster fire that a bunch of wealthy people have created and he's just kind of like sucked into this mess with them which I think is very similar to like the entire plot of The Great Gatsby is Nick being sucked into a bunch of shit that like wealthy people and their egos got them into. I think that Richard is very relatable and I think that's what makes him makes me like him as a character I think sometimes with relatable characters, it's hard because they almost show you parts of yourself that you don't like. I think that Richard is definitely a great example of this because, you know, he doesn't stand up to things at times when he should be standing up for himself or for others. He's kind of a pushover. And I think one of the things that I related to the most is just like, Richard is overlooked a lot in social settings. Not always, I think it gets better as it progresses throughout the book, but especially in the beginning, he's just like overlooked by other people and I think that people such as myself who I was very shy and quiet growing up I think that's why like I related to Richard so much because he is more of a quiet like reserved character for a lot of it I think the next person I want to talk about is Henry oh Henry if this story was like how do I describe this okay so basically Richard is like the son in this book and everyone else are just planets that revolve around him, and his gravity dictates everything that happens throughout the rest of the story. I personally went through the stages of hating Henry, then loving him, and being a little bit cautious towards him, and then hating him again, and then at the end it was just like pity. Like you basically just kind of have nothing but pity for this person. It's interesting because I think that in most books that I read, like, the main character is the driving force and, like, dictating most of the actions that happen throughout the book. Like, I think in a lot of ways you could actually describe Henry as kind of the main character and Richard is just kind of, like, the observer and obviously he's the narrator, but Henry drives the entire story and everything and all the shit that happens in it. And he's also very charismatic. I can see why all of these people are so drawn to him in, like, honestly toxic way because, like, you as the reader, at least I was, like, also drawn to him in that way. So I could kind of justify why Richard is so, like, enamored with Henry and why everyone else is as well. So Francis is next. So Francis ended up being my favorite character in the story, I think. In the beginning, actually, maybe until, like, halfway through the book, I think Charles and Francis, honestly, like, I would get them confused in my head all the time because there was nothing that 
either of them really did that like kind of like separated one from the other so they were kind of interchangeable in my head until the story started to develop and then they go on two completely different paths. I like Francis because he is just cool first of all. He dresses cool, he kind of seems like he's like Snape going about campus in like his long robes, he comes from a lot of money, he's like the good queer rep that we need in the story and I think by the end of it he is the only other person in this friend group besides Richard who kind of sees it for like the absolute shit show that it is and I think that Francis has a very good more of what am I trying to say he sees the people what am, what <laughs> I can't think of the words I'll just try to say it like this Francis sees through bullshit okay <laughs> and I think that's why towards the end you almost see him as like another island of like possible mental stability between him and Richard, even though Francis is also just, like, completely off the deep end, which you see later, like, everyone's just, like, struggling mentally with, like, all these different things. Let's talk about Camilla now. I think one of the only criticisms I have about the book, I have a couple, but this is one of the ones that I wanted to name, is that there are just not very many, uh, female characters throughout the book that I think can be argued as, like, a strong character. I liked Camilla through most of the book and I liked that she kind of balanced this duality between being masculine and feminine at the same time that I think could only be written by a woman. However, towards the end of the story, I think once you discover like a secret about her that you don't really, it's not, it's not very, it's not very pretty. We'll just put it like that. I think after that, that just kind of like cut, cut the tie. It was like the nail in the coffin for me disliking Camilla. I was just like, ugh. I think Camilla is also one of the more manipulative characters throughout the book because she really drags along Richard and the rest of them unnecessarily. We'll talk about Charles. So like I said, for most of the book, I didn't really distinguish Charles from Francis very much until later and Charles loses his fucking mind. So I think that is the reason why towards the end of the book, I was like, oh, Oh, fuck. Everyone loses their mind in this book, but uh, Charles and Henry get the worst of it. Like, Charles is just like, he basically becomes like a fucking nut job. It's also interesting because I think like you can see Charles' like mental state like deteriorate um, as the book progresses. Like through most of it, he's very stable. And then in the second half of the book, you start to see him like very quickly spiral. And I think that Donna Tartt does a good job at like branching each progression of his spiral in a way that like it makes sense why his downturn is just like fucking crazy. Okay, so we're going to talk about Bunny now. Oh, Bunny. Um, here's the thing. Bunny is kind of, well, I know that Donna Tartt wrote him like this on purpose, but he is a character that's like kind of hard to like. I mean, he's uh homophobic and he's sexist. So those two things already, I'm like, how are these people putting up with him as a friend, basically? I just... I, uh, anyway, does that justify his murder? Obviously not. But there are parts of Bunny that I think are endearing to read about and, like, parts of him that, like, really do make him an endearing character. I also just wanted to throw in... God, who is the drug dealer's name? Why can I not remember it now? I Sorry, I read this book. It's been a minute. But I did want to talk about... Judy. Judy's a real one. Shout out to Judy Poovy. I think she's like honestly one of the best parts of the story. <laughs> she just like she's awesome. I think Donna Tart did a really great job at like embodying kind of like a sorority girl, party girl, fun girl, you know, just Judy. She did a great job at embodying someone like Judy, but then also someone who's like not Judy. God. Oh no, I can feel my brain cells like starting to die from talking so much so this is the last thing i'm going to talk about before this starts to like become a mess the true villain of this story is julian so here's the thing that's kind of hard about julian is that he's very likable and you look to him as like this both a fatherly figure and someone you respect and like a figure of authority who just kind of seems to be this like eye of the storm when all of this shit is going on like he still provides this sense of comfort not only to Richard and the reader but like the rest of the characters but I think that Julian is the villain of the story because first he isolates the other characters from the rest of the school this is very explicitly mentioned in the book you know like before Richard joins this program like he's cautioned that basically he's kind of going off on his own without the support of the rest of the school if he chooses to study under Julian 
and I think that this is one of the greatest disservices that Julian does to the other characters. He does it for his own ego. Basically, he isolates them from the rest of the school and other support systems that they could have that I think is a huge part of what starts this horrific spiral of all of the events that happen in the story and the murder of Bunny and then the fallout of the group, all because of like the beliefs and the values that Julian passes on to the others and they just take in willingly because they look up to him so much, especially uh, Henry. Julian reminds me a lot of Professor Slughorn in Harry Potter in the way that like Professor Slughorn has like the slug club of like basically students that he treats as like ornaments and you know treats them differently from other students because of a level of like wealth or status or popularity or beauty that they have and Julian essentially does the same thing with his own students which is just like fucked basically his six students in this program wait six one two three four five six yeah six students they're basically ornaments in his life and he doesn't seem to really break down like how the teachings that he's passing on to them like how it could be negatively impact impacting them I mean I'm sure he didn't expect that his teachings would make a murderer out of Henry but it's also like for someone who's so educated and so brilliant minded I think that his own ego is what destroys like the future of the other students if Henry wasn't in the equation, then, like, I don't think any of this would have happened, so, like, Henry is a villain in his own right, but I think that, like, Henry's tether that initially pulls him down this well of madness is definitely Julian, so I think that you can trace all of the horrible things that happened in this story back to Julian, even though he's, like, a seemingly innocent character. I think that Julian is the true villain of this story, which is kind of hard because, him, like all of the other characters who are kind of fucked, like there are parts of them that you still like and enjoy and you find familiar and you seek comfort in these characters. But yeah, basically like fuck Julian. That's like the moral of this entire story. I've been talking so much. I really want to go get coffee or something. So I hope you can go get a fun treat or a fun drink as well. Thank you for sitting here and listening um, to this with me. I feel like there's so many other things I wanted to talk about with this that I just can't seem to think of them right now, but I think this is long enough. I hope that you enjoy it. I want to hear your thoughts. If you read The Secret History, do you agree with any of these points? Like, what are things that I missed? I would love to hear about those things. I hope that you have a lovely rest of your day. If you haven't read The Secret History, I hope that you read it. Okay, I love you. Okay, bye. Mwah.